Thank you very much. I uh, very much appreciate being invited by the Mariposa Museum to give uh, this presentation about Henry David Thoreau and his relationship uh, with Native Americans, a relationship that grew out of his uh, activities as an arrowheader, as a collector of prehistoric artifacts. Um, and of course, uh, he did that in Massachusetts and New Hampshire, as well as uh, in other parts of New England. And so it very much speaks to the ground where um, I'm speaking from, from Martha's Vineyard. It also uh, from the other venue of the Mariposa Museum. Uh, this lecture was originally given at the University of Gothenburg where many of the foremost Thoreau scholars were gathered for an international symposium uh, in 2018. And it was the culminating lecture. Uh, what it was commissioned, in fact, by the convener of the symposium who thought that uh, it would be interesting to have a prehistorian look at Thoreau in an entirely new way. Oops, let me see how I'm... So we're going to go on a journey uh, from, we're going to follow how Thoreau's relationship with prehistoric artifacts led to a changing relationship with their makers. Their makers, uh, of course, in the past, but that increase increasingly led to encounters with their descendants and with efforts to find out more about the artifacts by deepening his relationships with Native Americans today, or actually in his day. Um, and as we examine his evolving relationship with Native Americans, I'm going to make an argument. The thesis of this talk is that arrowheading changed Thoreau's thinking uh, so profoundly that he was about to give voice in a book about arrowheading, which would have been as limited to the subject of arrowheading as Walden was to a pond. Um, that was going to be a cry against the persecution of the American race, as he put it. The, the, this, this talk, though, has a very strange origin, um, and that is false advertising. And false advertising, not by anyone you would expect to disseminate uh, false facts. It was from the Peabody Museum at Harvard, and they sent out uh, a newsletter on August 5th, 2017. They also posted it on Facebook. Uh, it was an invitation to come to the museum to see Thoreau's prehistoric artifacts in celebration of um, the 200th anniversary uh, of Th Henry David Thoreau of his birth. And when I received this, this uh, email from uh, the Peabody Museum, I was actually in a hospital room seated next to my wife who was dying. And I had no intention of uh, studying Thoreau uh, from this point of view, although the convener of the symposium very much wanted me to, uh, because I didn't think I had anything to say. Uh, I thought, well, uh, the quickest way to put a room full of Thoreau scholars to sleep would be to talk about the tool typology, the types of stones at the felt sites and rhyolites and things like that, that the tools were made out of, and unless I had something original, some original insight 
to uh, to provide, then I, I didn't I really didn't want to get involved. But suddenly I had my scoop, and that was that I recognized in this photograph sent out by Harvard that three of the objects were European. Now I'm particularly uh, well placed to recognize objects by their forms and their patinas, their napping styles as uh, coming from particular places in the world because I've written a great many typology guides, especially to the prehistoric artifacts of the old world. So I recognized the uh, biface, the hand axe at the top left uh, by its patina and form as coming from Northern France, from the Somme or Oise watersheds um, and being probably around 300,000 years old from a period called the Echelaean, um, the, the axe head uh, with the hole running through it was clearly from the, uh, from the Baltic area probably from Northern Germany or Denmark. Uh, it's quite typical of what's known as a battle ax from that area. And then the, the polished ax at, on the right uh, ha is characteristic with its, its, um, its straight sides and its patina and its overall form as coming probably uh, from central Denmark. Uh, the only other place it might have come from, and I don't think it did because it, it, this is a peat bog patina, is from southern Sweden facing Denmark. So we had three art European artifacts, and I thought, who knew? Thoreau was a, uh, uh, was, you know, he, the stereotype of him is that uh, he was a hermit in the woods, that is not true, uh, but he never traveled outside of the United States except for a brief sojourn in Quebec. And um, he did have uh, some correspondence with uh, English intellectuals. Um, uh, the, he was, Carlyle wrote about him after hearing about uh, Thoreau from his friend Emerson. But I had never heard of him having correspondents who provided him with European prehistoric tools. And I thought, well, there might be an entire hidden correspondence and hidden uh, commercial relationships. And it would certainly uh, an investigation of these European prehistoric artifacts in his collection would cast an entirely new light on Thoreau. And so I called Harvard and discovered that um, they didn't want to show me the artifacts, that they, I already had an appointment with them to study other prehistoric artifacts. And I said, well, you, I, of course, you have to show them to me. You, I'm a researcher, I already have a, an appointment with you to study uh, prehistoric lithophones, uh, stone instruments from New England. Um, and you've just invited the entire world to come and see Thoreau's collection. So I expect you to show them to me. And at that point, they admitted to me that in fact, uh, the reason they couldn't show them to me was because Thoreau had never owned those artifacts, the European artifacts in the, that last picture. Uh, they, someone in the PR department had decided to sex up the picture by adding European artifacts that Thoreau had never seen. And uh, so the picture you're looking at now, uh, which contains some of the artifacts that we saw in that photograph sent out by the Peabody uh, to in, as an invitation um, were in fact owned by Thoreau. He did find these artifacts and there are some really exceptional artifacts, but all of these 
are American. All of them are from New England. So we have to be careful uh, uh, whenever we cite sources because even the most prestigious and authoritative sources may not be entirely reliable. But why in the, should a, a prehistorian be looking at Thoreau in the first place? Well, we'll see that in fact, uh, one good reason is that he was a very precocious prehistorian himself. He was one of the first people to think about the depth of time, not only um, in the in New England, but in the entire world. And his definition for prehistory actually still holds, an era which can never have its history, which is older than the invention of history. Um, and I should just note that these uh, citations in parentheses, for example, 1842 to 1844, refer to his journals. And so this is journal two from that period. And you can find the, these quotes for yourself um, on the pages I've cited. This particular slide shows a Levana point that he found. Uh, it's a very beautiful uh, uh, point style arrowhead from the uh, early woodland period. It's around 2000 years old and then the gouge, which is a woodworking tool, uh, just beneath it shown uh, on both sides is, a, is typical of the mid to late archaic. Uh, and that places it from around 6,000 years ago until somewhere around three and a half thousand years ago. Some other reasons why uh, we might want to consider Thoreau as a prehistorian, one of the first in North America, is because he thought so deeply and uh, in so many ways about the relationships of uh, prehistoric tools to landscapes, to their lithic sources, to uh, the way they were made. He traced, for example, a particular type of stone that was used to make a lot of the tools that he found around Concord to this particular place, Mount Kineo in Maine. And there on the right is a, a, a beautiful uh, bifacial knife that's been made out of Mount Kineo rhyolite, or as he called it, Mount Kineo hornstone. He also uh, discussed the relationship of artifacts to contours, elevations, soil types, flood levels, erosion patterns, and weathering. He noted the way they were made, the particular geometry created by hitting the stone when a human hits the stone and it creates a conchoidal fracture. Um, he discussed their patination processes. And he even analyzed how sites were exposed by soil deflation. So as wind, for example, would scour away the, would blow away the sand and soil uh, from uh, an ancient layer, it would leave the artifacts, the stone artifacts exposed. And here's his quote, the wind began to blow away the soil until it was blown away to the depth of several feet and the ground appeared strewed with the remains of an Indian village. And as he learned how to read all of these signs, he became a more and more effective artifact collector. Another reason why arrowheading was important to him was because it was emotionally charged. Many uh, passages in his journals read like an arrowheader's manifesto. I go in search of arrowheads, so I help myself to live worthily. It is a good calorium to look on the bare earth, to pour over it so much 
getting strength to all your senses. Indeed, you can hardly name more innocent or wholesome entertainment. The, um, he died in 1862, uh, and the, an arrowheading or artifact, you know, prehistoric artifact collecting um, remained a source, uh, a tonic, a, a source of revitali revitalization for him almost up to his death. Here we see him uh, saying that in his journal, Indian relics are evidence of the vital energy of their makers. Many as I have found, the last one gives me about the same delight that the first one did. And these two quotes are, uh, span about 15 years, and the last one does come relatively close to his death. So we can see how important it remained for, all, for his entire adult life. Another reason why arrowheading was important to Thoreau is because it gave him a sense of companionship amidst solitude. We think of him sauntering around Concord and walking uh, along the Merrimack River and uh, out to Truro on Cape Cod, being alone. But the person who had introduced him to arrowheading was his brother John, who died of lockjaw, of tetanus. Uh, very quickly after cutting himself with a razor. Uh, and he, every time he found an artifact, it would harken back to his youth with John, with, to this, the presence of his beloved brother, um, who he mourned so, so intensely that after John died, he developed this uh, the symptoms by a sort of sympathetic symptoms of tetanus himself and uh, it was only in coming out of a paralysis uh, induced by grief that uh, he had the the revelation the epiphany in which he began, he, he decided that he was going to uh, mourn uh, John through his interactions with the natural world. And it wasn't just John who he felt kinship with, companionship with when he was arrowheading. It was any being. It was past inhabitants. It was, um, as we can see here, both people and animals. I have found an arrowhead or two in partridge dust baths and am pleased to find that I have been preceded by any creature. I love the fact that he found uh, this link to both humans and birds in the same place. Wherever I go, I am still on the trail of the Indian. And so arrowhead, arrowheading uh, created time warps that made him reflect about the past inhabitants of the same landscapes. And we'll see that those time warps or kind of time trap doors allowed him to drop through into new ways of thinking that were really quite original for a, an American of European origin of uh, his time. Another reason he was drawn to prehistoric artifacts was their sheer durability. Um, the, here are some of the things he said about how durable they were. The arrowhead shall perhaps never cease to wing its way through the ages to eternity. They are a perpetual reminder to the generations. He even uh, thought that arrowheads would outlast Nineveh's bulls and the British Museum itself. 
here he is speaking to that point. When the British Museum and winged bulls of Nineveh shall have lost most, if not all their features, the arrowheads which the museum contains, resume their shining. These are our antiquities and they are cleaner to think of than the rubbish of the Tower of London. So here he is staking a somewhat chauvinistic American intellectual's claim to, as it were, the importance of America through its prehistory, through its own antiquity, claiming that it was equally important to anything from the old world. And this intuition that Thoreau had that uh, the arrowheads he was finding around Concord were as were older than, than the bulls of Nineveh, for example, and just about anything in the British Museum, uh, prepared him for Darwin's long evolutionary time scale. We'll see that he um, would be one of the very first readers of Darwin's Origin of the Species in the United States. Uh, he was in a group in Concord who met uh, to read aloud the very first copy of The Origin of the Species sent over uh, with a friend of Darwin's by Darwin himself, a sort of advanced copy, and then they discussed it late into the night they were literally the first people on the continent to engage with the idea that time was deep enough to allow for the evolution of species. Mm -hmm. And it was arrowheading that allowed him to make that uh, step. So he was staking a claim for America. Uh, Indian arrow artifacts equaled or excelled Greek and Roman ones in antiquity, mystery, and of course, proximity. They were conveniently at his front door. Such are our antiquities, he said. Why then make so great ado about the Roman and the Greek and neglect the Indian? Here is a point still more significant at our doors, probably more ancient than any other, and it has not been deciphered. This is key because the idea that these were riddle stones, that each artifact that he discovered was a, a contained an impaction of stories that he couldn't quite get at, but he intuited they were there was one of the, the reasons why he was just so drawn by them. He, in order to, to find these, these, uh, these riddle stones, these, these story nuggets, these durable uh, mysteries, he had to, he felt that he had to think like a Native American. He had to enter the Native mindset and read line, the landscapes uh, from uh, a dim different perspectives from uh, different, that meant uh, seeing them in their temporal depth, uh, see, imagining how they might have been used in a different economy with different subsistence systems. And, um, and as he began to understand where sites were positioned in landscapes, it made him a more and more effective artifact uh, collector, finder. Here he is uh, discovering how to find artifacts in the landscape. I'm pretty sure to find Indian relics on any knoll which is left dry above the flood. And one is as surely guided in, in this search by the locality and nature of the soil as to berries. So sandy knolls on floodplains, that were practically a sure bet. 
where uh, he also found artifacts among pitch pines, but he not, didn't find very many among swamp maples or in hilly oak forest. And as he realized that the vegetation and the topography could lead him to the sites, he discovered that the landscapes uh, could be, weren't just what his neighbors were seeing when they walked around Concord. They were, they had dimensions that practically no other American was seeing. Another thing that drew him to arrowheading was that it made the world, the, or the, the earth seem voluptuous. All the undulations of the earth, its nerves and muscles, the tawny Cuchin Island strewn with its arrowheads, the water rising with swelling lip kisses Indian isles and promontories. Myriads of arrow points lie sleeping in the skin of the revolving earth the mind print of the oldest men. As you can see, his journal, the passages about arrowheading in his journals read like love letters. And he's, as he walks, he's practically, he's, he's, he's in love with the, the soil at his feet and with the, the discoveries he's making. A funny thing about reading the, pa the passages about arrowheading in Thoreau's journals uh, is that they reveal his tics as a writer. And I think a writer's tics are absolutely fascinating because they're not always uh, conscious. Uh, in this case, they're probably a combination of conscious and, um, and rhetorical, uh, unconscious and rhetorical, rhetorical. The particular tick that uh, I found really compelling was the way he juxtaposes russet versus green. Their Indian memory is in harmony with the russet hue of the fall, he says in, eight, in the early 40s. Now is the season to look for Indian relics, the greenish hill, the green pines, the russet earth, cleansed surfaces. Now look for an early crop of arrowheads for they will shine. And here we see a couple other uh, sort of types of imagery, types of words that he associates with, with prehistoric artifacts over and over again. The idea, the idea of uh, purity, of cleanliness, and of brilliance, of shining. Uh, and both of them joined with the idea of, of a crop, of, of something uh, that will plant seeds in, in at least the mind. How attractive the shores of russet capes, how fair that low undulating russet land Russet appears to me the most agreeable of colors, and I begin to dream of a russet fairyland and Elysium. How dark and terrene must be green, but this smooth russet surface reflects almost all the light, its fine russet swords, firm and soft as velvet, reflecting so much light. Dry land for the Indian's wigwam, strewn with his arrowheads. At this season, when the russet colors prevail, Indian Isles and promontories are russet Elysium. If I imagine the fairest earth, I can. It is still russet. So, the fascinating to see how he he fixes on these two colors, and there was actually a symbolic reason. Uh, for why he did so. He imagined that his eye was a temporal prism and he associated these colors, one, russet with history and two, green with destiny. So in other words, 
Uh, russet symbolized the past, green symbolized the future, and he was at the edge, the present between the two, always in equilibrium, always in balance between the past and future. Nature has her russet hues as well as green. Indeed, our eyes splits on every object. If I consider its history, it is old. If it's destiny, it is new. So more words linked with arrowheading that we've already encountered uh, among the russets and greens, shining, bright, clean, and cleansed. Here are some of his, uh, his uh, quotes on the, that bring this out. Indian relics shining on them in the fields, arrowheads washed bright in the rain. Anacreon noticed the same shine and arrowheads and cleansed air. No disgusting mummy, but a clean stone, the red man his mark. I should just um, uh, say in passing that uh, the pictures on the two on the sides of this slide show uh, arrowheads or uh, perhaps addle addle points or knives but in any case uh, prehistoric bifaces uh, found on Martha's Vineyard, uh, where I live, among the shore gravels, uh, where they, after they had washed out of the banks. Um, and the little sketch in the middle is a, um, is the silhouette of an arrowhead in Thoreau's journals. So it's the silhouette of an arrowhead that he found. We've already seen this word uh, that he associated with arrowheads, crop, a new crop of arrowheads in, 19, in 1855. It is now high time to look for arrowheads. I am the first to gather a crop of arrowheads, the perennial crop of conquered fields. And those last two quotes come from just um, about two years before he died. And he, I should say, although it was two years before he died, uh, he was terribly, terribly ill with tuberculosis already. And uh, so he was very much in the process of dying, even when he was out looking for arrowheads in 1859. Arrowheading also came to be to be opposed in his mind to the, the event which was drawing so many young men away from New England in his generation after 1849, and that is the California Gold Rush. Uh, he came to think of them as, as the equivalent of gold, but in conquered sands. I am the first to gather a crop of arrowheads, somewhat as gold is washed in a dish. I feel no desire to go to California or Pikes Peak, but I often think at night with inexpressible satisfaction and yearning of the arrowheadiferous sands of Concord. This is the gold which our sands yield. Again, these quotes are from near, the, close to the end of his life, and as we'll see, it, he began to think more and more about the importance of well, the, the implications of arrowheading for him and for and and to take the the as it were the these hard facts, each durable hard fact of an arrowhead, uh, and to to starting from that fact, to go off on a riff, to play with that note and to seek its philosophical and other implications. Looking for artifacts, and I say this as a long time prehistoric artifact hunter myself, uh, I've sought prehistoric artifacts since I was um, 
about five years old. Um, and, and I, I know that if I concentrate on uh, looking for clues, I, I may very well pass an anomaly, which is even more important than the predictable things that one might find. And if I look for the anomalies, I won't be attuned to those little conchoidal fractures, those little bits of a speck of, of a color of a stone, which was preferred in prehistory, that would lead me to the more predictable things. So finding being a, a very uh, effective artifact uh, finder requires the development of a scan pattern that uh, is balanced between a sort of attention and trance, between uh, concentration on looking for the predictable and open-mindedness. Uh, you have to look through thousands of random details and in apparently uh, broad open spaces without landmarks. And um, it's, it's a little bit like keeping in a yogic balance. And I wondered if uh, having trained himself to maintain this sort of yogic balance of uh, being attentive and yet in a kind of trance uh, from, uh, from childhood when he would hunt with John onwards had informed the way Thoreau looked at other things in the world. And I think it did. Here's an example of how someone else, his, one of his very best friends, William Ellery Channing, who was a, an important American poet at that time, uh, and the Thoreau kept his skiff in uh, Channing's backyard uh, to go rowing on the, the rivers that run through Concord. And so they were often, um, uh, they often spent the days together uh, rowing back and forth on these rivers. Even in the boat, he had a wary transitory air his eyes on the outlook, constantly sort of fixing on things and then m moving rapidly on. So it, that sounds very much like the scan pattern of a good arrow header. He became so good at finding artifacts that he began to think that he was reaching a sort of clairvoyance here he is in 1851. I have frequently distinguished these localities half a mile, gone forward and picked up arrowheads. Here he is later. I had expected to find as much as this and in this very spot too before I reached it. Indeed, I never find a remarkable Indian relic and I find a good many, but I have first divined its existence and planned the discovery of it. So he basically feels, rightly or wrongly, that he's fallen through time, that he has, he has become, uh, he's developed a, almost supernatural, perhaps a supernatural ability to make contact with the artifacts and by extension, perhaps with their makers. Arrowheading led him to seek contact increasingly with, the ma with those makers. And so to going, on, going to Maine, for example, uh, to being increasingly outdoors, to camping. Uh, and as he, much of this of going to Maine and of being outdoors, uh, he associated with trying to acquire uh, Indian instincts that may seem presumptuous, but um, he was trying very hard to get out of his skin to imagine the world from uh, other perspectives. And here we see him beginning to have the sense that he was at least partially successful. We had pitched our camp upon the very spot 
which a few summers before had been occupied by a roving party of Penobscots, as if we had been led by an Indian instinct. That's an early quote. Um, so by reading landscapes better, uh, he, he found a great many sites uh, around Concord. Uh, he found at least these 19. And I just think it would be such a wonderful way uh, of seeing Concord anew, of following in Thoreau's footsteps from a totally different perspective if an itinerary was created that would take us through uh, many of these points. And you can see that they have, they're, they're quite precise. He gives uh, very clear indications as to where the sites are located. So that itinerary definitely could be, um, could, could be created. He also, of course, went arrowheading uh, beyond Concord. Um, he found a, a beautiful tool on the high bank uh, in Truro and Cape Cod. Uh, he found m more artifacts uh, near Bangor and on the Penobscot River. Uh, he again near New Bedford uh, and he even went searching for petroglyphs uh, I, near Lakeville. Um, just a, a word about this picture on the right. Uh, it's a blowout site on Sandy Neck in Barnstable in, on Cape Cod. Um, it's quite likely that he found it. I found it afterwards. You can see where the prehistoric layer uh, has been exposed by the blowout among dunes. Uh, it's, the, it's a very, it's a thin brown layer uh, and then the, the brown uh, earth, charcoal uh, and uh, carbon rich earth is uh, spreading down in, onto the sand below. And the little white specks that you see are the bits of ancient shell uh, from prehistoric meals that, uh, you know, the, so this brown carbon rich layer also is filled with the with food waste with middens, um, and he would definitely have noticed that he understood soil deflation as we've seen, and this is a good example of a soil deflated site. So here's the part that I was afraid would bore uh, Thoreau scholars to death: early typology, but in Early typology is very interesting in, in because it shows the range and uh, the, the temporal range and the range of forms of Thoreau's finds. Uh, one of the oldest of his finds is probably the late Paleolithic uh, lancelet uh, over on the left, top left. Um, it's made of a Hudson Valley chert Chert is uh, basically synonymous with flint. There are a number of Hudson Valley cherts which are known as uh, Onondaga is one of the, the, the main ones. Um, and this, you can see where it's been chipped, the color of the original stone, a darker gray. And this, uh, but over uh, about 10,000 years, it's patinated, so it has a, a milky patina. The outline of the bifurcate point uh, next to it uh, would have been, shows a point type that's very old, nine to 8,000 before present. Uh, it has disappeared. We don't know where it is. Uh, Harvard has 990 inventoried uh, prehistoric artifacts that did belong to Thoreau. And this particular one uh, is not amongst them. So uh, Thoreau certainly found more than the 990 uh, that are held by Harvard. Um, 
as we move generally towards the right across the screen, we come forward in time towards the present and we see uh, various types of, of we see how these point types evolve through time and knife types. Down below, we see a beautiful gouge, the one we saw earlier, and a banner stone, which is probably a, an addle addle counterweight uh, at bottom right. Speaking of gouges, Thoreau found quite a few, uh, an amazing number, and suggesting that uh, archaic uh, sites were quite plentiful around Concord and uh, they're, they're absolutely beautiful tools. The gouges are, these gouges are typical of the late archaic from about 5,000 to 3,000 years before present. The, here are some of the more most beautiful of the uh, more recent artifacts that he found. Uh, I'm was amazed to see this beautiful mansion in blade in the middle. Uh, it's huge. That uh, little scale at the bottom is one centimeter uh, across. So that gives an idea of the scale of this magnificent artifact. There are quite a range of stone types as well. Um, we, the Levana point that we've encountered a few times over on the top left is made out of felt site. Uh, the reddish uh, arrowhead at far at top right is made of Monsungan shirt. Um, the two uh, arrowheads at bottom left are of uh, a grayish green uh, Wakefield rhyolite. And the two points on the uh, bottom right are made of Barrington argillite. So there are quite a range of stones being used uh, locally. And um, some of the most exotic stones are linked to the more, to the, the rarer items that he found. One thing he was, particularly, uh, he, he was particularly proud of was uh, this spatulate object at top right, um, which he called a, a clam opener. Uh, and it's made out of slate. Um, then um, as we've seen that particular bifurcate point at the bottom, um, has gone missing. The most surprising object in the collection is this thing. Now, I know it doesn't look like the most beautiful artifact, and yet I think it's one of the most transcendental artifacts of in, in American prehistory. The reason why is that it's a, a bit of a uh, it's the remains of a steatite bowl. And on the steatite bowl, you have inside and out punctuated circles. The punctuated circles don't correspond in time with steatite bowls in the artifact sequence. Steatite bowls are associated with the late archaic. They date from about two and a half thousand years ago to about three and a half thousand years ago, generally. And uh, although circles occasionally occur in the iconography of the period, uh, these punctuated circles appear to have been made with a metal tool. Uh, probably, it, they could have been made with a compass, with scissors, uh, or a wood auger. And my guess is they were made with a wood auger. Um, so all of those tools, uh, all of those metal tools uh, were, they only existed after the Europeans introduced uh, iron metallurgy into North America. 
they didn't exist in the late archaic. So there's a, um, a discrepancy between the medium here, the steatite bowl, and the decoration on it. And that begs to be explained. So three hypotheses. One is that a post-contact Indian uh, found this bowl and decorated it. Uh, that's possible. Another is that Thoreau, as it were, uh, well, he found a, an ancient bowl and that he decorated it. And if you think about it, he was um, a carpenter. He built his cabin uh, on Walden Pond. Uh, and he was a surveyor. So he had all of the tools uh, to have decorated such a bowl. And we can see that he actually uh, used, he made punctuated circles, uh, for example, in the surveying of Walden Pond itself. So I think of him finding this bowl, um, whether or not he made the, the circles on it, and it wasn't cup. I think he would have naturally uh, seen, in taken, uh, dipped it into the waters of the pond, lifted it to his face, and looked out over those waters where the only circles were made by ice fishermen making holes with augers uh, in, in the winter by raindrops hitting the, the pond surface and cratering it with ripples with and uh, the reflections of the sun and moon. So he would have been looking across his own little miniature Walden pond at the real thing. But I think there's a third explanation, which is even more likely than that he, that he decorated uh, this bowl. The reason I think so is because of marks found in some of the oldest timber frame houses in New England, and specifically the Fairbanks house in Dedham, which was built in 1637. As you can see from the picture on the left, we have punctuated circles, uh, and these punctuated circles were uh, made as hex marks, as anti-witching devices uh, to keep uh, diabolical agents from entering the house. And they're typical of um, medieval Europe. They're typical of England from which the people who were settling in New England in the uh, 1600s uh, had come. And they, so they are prophylactic evil eyes. They were, they, we find them quite commonly, uh, almost always on, on shattered, polished, and apparently fragments of prehistoric tools in Eastern Massachusetts. So that raises the possibility that early colon European colonists who, um, were, who were basically invading and expropriating land from Native Americans were also appropriating it by, with European magic by whenever they found a, a prehistoric tool, a polished prehistoric tool, such as a polished ax, um, they may have tried to neutralize its effect. Their ancestors in England and France certainly had done so. Back in England and France, they thought that Neolithic polished axes that came to the surface were made by a, a violent and uh, in some ways malevolent force, lightning, uh, and that when lightning hit the ground, it would cre leave a, a polished axe, uh, which are of course often found after storms when the soil 
uh, eroded away and exposed these things. And so they would take these axes and they would bury them uh, under the hearths and thresholds of their homes uh, on, on the theory that lightning and malevolent forces in general never strike twice in the same place. And so if they put the cr what lightning had created uh, under their home, that the home would then be protected from further lightning strikes. But when European settlers came to New England, they, they couldn't, uh, they no longer could ascribe uh, ancient polished tools to lightning strikes because they saw indigenous Americans carrying stone uh, axes that were still hafted. And so they knew that these things were associated with the, the, the native people. And, but um, uh, the, the kind of diction, the, the kind of language used to describe um, witches, for example, during the Salem witch trials, uh, and Native Americans who were fighting a uh, guerrilla war in Maine at that time uh, against uh, European settlers is almost identical. Uh, the diction, the propaganda against Native American fighters was uh, reiterated against people's neighbors in Salem and North Andover. And uh, they were both described as um, diabolical agents. So how do you keep these diabolical agents from coming back and reclaiming their land? You break what they created, what you find in the fields, and you, you, you basically kill these objects and neutralize them with an anti-witching device. And I think that is what Thoreau may have found. A 3,000 year old cup that had been found when the European col colonists first arrived and for the first time used a uh, beast of traction to plow uh, and were and brought such things to the surface. Some early colonists around Concord must have found it and then recognized it as probably having been made by a Native American and neutralized it before casting it back into his field as the shard on the uh, right that is uh, an example of one of the many shards found in eastern Massachusetts that has what I think is an, uh, a hex mark on it. Oh, so prehistoric artifacts are also touchstones for thought. He, Thoreau, describes them as grain, dragon's teeth, seed, stone fruit, they are sown like a grain that is slow to germinate, like the dragon's teeth, which bore a crop of soldiers. These bear crops of philosophers and facts. And the same seed is just as good to plant again. It is stone fruit. Each one yields a thought. I come nearer to the maker of it than if I found his bones. It is humanity inscribed on the face of the earth. Well, as a lover of humanity, you can see why the earth became so voluptuous. Um, here are some more pictures of uh, arrowheads found in situ in local construction projects and beaches. Um, and like for Thoreau, I, when I find such a thing peeking out of a clod of dirt, I think of it as a mind print. Here he is speaking of to that. The arrowhead is a mind print left everywhere and altogether illegible. Time will soon destroy the works of famous painters and sculptors, but the Indian arrowhead will bulk his efforts. They are fossil thoughts 
forever reminding me of the mind that shaped them. I am treading in the tracks of human game. I am on the trail of mind. But Thoreau wasn't always, uh, didn't always think that uh, these artifacts represented living people. In his 20s, Thoreau thought of Native Americans as a vanished race. Here he is uh, writing in his early journals, the earth is strewn with the relics of a race which has vanished as completely as if trodden in with the earth. As we'll see, gradually, as he came to understand uh, the relationship of artifacts to the living descendants of their makers, uh, the idea that Native Americans had vanished, changed to uh, vanishing, which was still very problematic. Uh, it was basically what uh, many people assumed in the Western world that that non-Western people were in the process of vanishing before the onslaught of Western civilization. Uh, to his final position, which was totally different and, and absolutely revolutionary for a person, an American of European extraction. And that was that they were linked to, a peop to people who were enduring, who had a future. The pivoting from alienation, from the idea that Native Americans had vanished to the idea that they were enduring uh, was a complex process. It started with his recognition of equivalence and biases. Uh, here we see an example of him seeing an equivalency. Instead of the council house is the legislature. So he sees legislatures and Indian council houses basically as the same. For Indian deeds, there must be an Indian memory. The white man will remember his own only. And there he comes to terms with the extreme biases that uh, had uh, invaded the writing of, of history as written by uh, white Americans. Another thing that deepened his empathy was finding uh, prehistoric art. I particularly like this object, which actually, uh, which he did find and which does appear in that original uh, photograph sent out by the Peabody Museum. Uh, it is a, uh, described as a pestle. Uh, some of these objects are indeed uh, pestles with uh, heads at one end. They can be uh, the head of a, a bird very often. Uh, I know of one that has the head of apparently a wolf. Uh, and there are also others that have phallic or human heads. Um, but the longest ones probably aren't pestles. They're probably lithophones. They're two-toned musical instruments, and they are among, they are in fact probably the oldest known musical instruments uh, known from the uh, Western Hemisphere. Uh, and perhaps even from the, in the entire world, because they've also similar ones have been found, uh, for example, in the Sahara Desert, uh, where for reasons of, uh, of physics and ergonomics, uh, people uh, converged on the same solution to making an instrument out of stone. Um, so I've tested these instruments uh, at Harvard and elsewhere. And so I, I just, I think it's wonderful that here he is uh, seeing the, the head at one end of the pestle, as he called it, 
and uh, realizing that it brought the maker uh, close to himself and even his neighbors. It is a great step to find a pestle whose handle is ornamented with a bird's head knob. It brings the maker still nearer to the races which ornament their umbrella and cane handles. Men had fancies to be pleased and added some pure beauty to that of pure utility. But as you can see, he didn't realize that it might not be a pestle and that it might be a musical instrument. Let's see if we can uh, hear the fossil notes here being played uh, at the Peabody Museum at Harvard. Uh, and I'm hoping this will, you'll hear this. Here we go. If only Thoreau had known that his pestles were uh, also, in all probability, musical instruments, then I think his empathy with their makers would have been uh, even deepened. Well, he set out to learn about the artifacts in any way he could. And of course, one way to find out about uh, artifacts, especially prehistoric ones, is to visit museums. He did so. Uh, he even visited uh, P.T. Barnum's American Museum in New York, uh, the Essex Institute, the Plymouth Museum, and he would go to see private collectors. Um, Joseph Hosmer showed him a figural pestle or lithophone, uh, like the one that we just heard being played. Uh, Arthur Rickardson uh, down in Rhode Island, uh, also showed him uh, objects, including a soapstone pot, as he described it, uh, perhaps quite similar to the one that we saw with the uh, possible hex marks on it. Uh, and he would go to, to uh, any lecture on the subject that he, he could. Um, they were by geologist. Uh, there was a Dr. Harris who uh, spoke about uh, Native Americans. But the lecture which had the greatest impact on him was by a Chippewa uh, named Mungundos. I'm mispronouncing that. I'm sorry to say. Uh, and uh, this remarkable man. Uh, lectured internationally. Uh, he had been to Europe. He wrote a short book about uh, his observations during his, of his, in this trip uh, to Europe. And uh, he, he also sold things. He sold some patent medicines based on traditional herbal recipes. Uh, and he demonstrated a great many uh, Native American inventions. Uh, he was in, in many ways a more worldly, cosmopolitan, definitely well-traveled man than Thoreau himself. And yet he spoke with, a, um, with the inflections of his native language and Thoreau took great umbrage at the way some members of the audience were mocking the lecturer and felt uh, as a Thoreau himself made much of his living on the lecture circuit and the lecture circuit was opening up uh, America to uh, new ways of understanding things and it also opened Thoreau to sympathy for uh, for this the, his fellow lecturer, who went under the the stage name of Dr. Mung, I believe. So Dr. Mung's props were uh, extraordinarily varied. Uh, they included a cradle board, a blowgun, an otter skin pouch, birch bark trays ornamented with moose hair, a buffalo hide blanket uh, decorated with quill work. Um, 
And the Thoreau's fascination, and in fact, uh, Dr. Mung clearly realized that many people in his audience were fascinated by these inventions, I think was driven by a fascination at this, the, in the mid uh, 19th century for technology in general. Uh, and as people became fascinated with technology, they began to it began they began to look beyond stereotypes. They were so fascinated by this other aspect of what the what Native Americans were doing that they that they forgot. They just thought, well, this is ingenious. This is this is brilliant. And it led a lot of people on both sides of the Atlantic, including, for example, George Sand in, in France, who met with, uh, with uh, some of the Native Americans who came to Europe and wrote about them for uh, Le Figaro uh, to, to uh, admire them as brilliant uh, inventors and to begin to see them as worthy of respect and emulation. The role of, of uh, technology in uh, making Indians, quote unquote, Native Americans seem, uh, seem brilliant, inventive, uh, worthy of the utmost respect, uh, comes through over and over again in Thoreau's journals, especially when he describes canoe making. Uh, here he is speaking to that, the process of canoe making, which he described meticulously, uh, repeating what he had heard, deserves to be minutely described as much at least as most of the white man's arts. So again, he's seen equivalency. When uh, Mangudas uh, demonstrated how a cradle board was used, uh, it brought very three things into, into uh, synergy, the proximity of the object, fascination with technology, and seeing a man uh, who seemed as paternal, as loving as Thoreau was himself with children. And I'd just like to, on a, a side note, uh, when, when Ralph Waldo Emerson uh, went to England for several months uh, to receive the accolades uh, of the literary lions of, of uh, England uh, for his own writing, he and his wife asked Thoreau to move in to their home and be the Emerson's children, surrogate father. Not only did they know that he was a wonderful teacher, a great tutor, but he loved carrying them piggyback, uh, horsing around with them. And so although Thoreau never had children of his own, uh, he definitely would have empathized with uh, Dr. Mung, uh, as Dr. Mung was um, pretending to carry a child on his back. As he became more fascinated with Indian artifacts of all kinds, he began to seek out uh, native living Native Americans, despite being warned in the harshest terms against uh, employing them and get, against uh, dealing with them. Here he is being warned uh, not to employ uh, Native American guides in Maine. I was warned not to employ an Indian on account of their obstinacy and the difficulty of understanding one another and on account of their dirty habits in cooking, etc but I was bunt, bent on having an Indian at any rate. And so he employed uh, two men who had a profound effect upon him, uh, 
Joe Paulus and Joe Atien. Uh, and he would also, whenever he, he saw a Native American, he would, uh, he would go up and, and start a conversation, often show them his artifacts, ask them if they had any, could, could explain them. Um, here he is in 1838. He went up to an old uh, Native American man in Maine uh, during his first trip there. Uh, he made three. Uh, then he showed him arrowheads uh, in the early 40s. Uh, then um, here we see him hearing Indians, uh, his, his guides, um, speaking late into the night. We lay on our backs talking with the Indians till midnight. They were very sociable. And when they did not talk with us, kept up a steady stream of talk in their own language, I amused myself with trying to guess at their subject. Finally, he went to, uh, when he went to Cape Cod late in his life, he uh, spoke with, a, he encountered a Native American in Sandwich. And I, again, the subject was often uh, artifacts. That penultimate quote, is perhaps the most important one on this page. I mean, it's the most important citation on this page because he's encountering something new. Indian artifacts had led him to Indian words. And here he's hearing them, but the, the significance of what he's hearing hasn't quite sunk in yet. One thing he discovered, though, in listening attentively, eh, a bit eh, respectfully, was that he was somewhat surprised that as he listened to Native Americans speaking, that it was breaking down the stereotypes. They, were, they would refer to their folks. Uh, he heard them gossiping, laughing, and jesting. The Indians were not the invention of poets. They weren't stereotypes. I sat and heard Penobscot's gossip and laugh and jest. The Indians talked about our folks and your folks, my grandfather and my grandfather's cousin. He began to realize that we're all just human. So alien words began to impart their, uh, the fact that they carried uh, meanings that he never imagined, that he never would fully be able to fathom, uh, and that those meanings uh, conveyed ideas and observations that had never been incorporated into the Latinate terms that he was familiar with for describing species, for example. So until he encountered Native American words, uh, he, he thought that scientific terms were the best way of describing the natural world. Once he heard them, native words, he began to feel that scientific terms were partial and distant. It was a new light when my guide gave me Indian names for things, for which I had only scientific ones before. We are ready to skin the animals alive to come at them. Now, between parentheses, Thoreau uh, actually was one of the people collecting biological specimens for the uh, early zoologists and biologists at Harvard, for example. And so he knew very well what he was talking about. He was one of those people skinning animals. And, but he's referring also to the asters and their building up of a huge fortune, one of the greatest fortunes amassed on the planet at that time, which was through the fur trade. And he saw it in the same ways that we might see big oil today. 
as a rapacious industry that was worldwide and was destroying species everywhere in the world, driving them to extinction. Our scientific names, here he is again speaking, our scientific names convey a very partial information only. There are other names for most of these objects given by a people who stand between me and them, who had better senses than our race. How little I know of that arbor vitae when I have learned only what science can tell me. The, as he realized that, that his guides had uh, powers of observation that even he was so attuned to the natural world who had trained himself to read landscapes backwards in time, for example, he began to associate Native Americans, or at least some of them, with a, a degree of intimacy with nature that he really felt he, he needed to emulate. Here he is admiring a guide. Before we landed, he had seen a drop of blood on the bank when it was two or three rods distant, something Thoreau could not have done. The Indian still remembered that he was a sojourner in nature. When he was refreshed with food and sleep, he contemplated his journey again. He dwelt in a tent in this world. He wanted very much to be able to do the same. So this uh, increasing contact with Native American uh, words and ways of thinking uh, made him realize that in order that the only way for him to expand his intimacy and his knowledge uh, with the natural world uh, was to go beyond science and to enter a natural intimacy that he associated with Native Americans. No science does more than arrange what knowledge we have of any class of objects. How much more conversant was the Indian with any wild animal or plant than we are? The Indian stood nearer to wild nature than we. So, I let science slide. Science with its retorts would have put me to sleep. I have much to learn of the Indian nothing of the missionary. So Thoreau was learning uh, from Native American terms to acquire that, that intimacy. And as he did so, it made his approach to science more holistic. Here he is giving a definition uh, of science, of a, of a scientist, which is not the one most frequently associated with scientists uh, even today. The true man of science with a rare Indian wisdom, he will smell, taste, see, hear, feel better than other men. His will will, his will be a deeper and finer experience. We do not learn by inference and deduction, but by direct intercourse, we cannot know truth by method and contrivance, the most scientific should be the healthiest man. He also began to associate uh, Native Americans, or many of them, with, uh, an, with the ancient Greeks, with another people who he felt uh, had uh, brought forth many, as it were, naturally noble uh, heroes. Um, and one of the reasons that he admired the Greeks as he admired Native Amer many Native Americans is because of their intercourse with nature. Here he is uh, giving voice to that. The Greeks were not above this humane intercourse with nature. They took note of and delight in such trifling events like Indians. An Indian squaw, now that is a word that has, uh, uh, is now uh, seen by many people as having pejorative uh, connotations. Um, we have to be really careful 
when uh, looking at words like brute and savage and squaw uh, in Thoreau's parlance, uh, not to read them in, as pure pejoratives or in a modern sense, because that would be a very presentist and falsifying point of view. The other reason why is because um, he often, as it were, co-opted these words. He would turn them on their heads. He knew that they were uh, pejoratives for many of his, uh, many uh, European Americans. And so he would turn them around, as we'll see. But here he is, he's observing this woman and he says, an Indian squaw, a daughter of the soil, one of the nobility of the land, the white man in imported weed, burdock and mullion, which displace <clears throat> the native, I should, uh, between parentheses, ground nut. <clears throat> this brings us to a convergence of two groups that Thoreau thought would produce people of true nobility. Indians and workers. Uh, these workers uh, included railroad workers, uh, who he thought were uh, noble, had, had the capacity to produce nobility, uh, and lumberjacks, lumbermen, as he called them. The most famous philosophers and poets seem infantile in comparison with these easy profligate giants. And here he's talking about railroad men. Under some ancient, wrinkled, almost forlorn visage, as of Indian chieftain slumber the world famous humanities of man. There is the race and you need look no further or farther. Um, and, and he, in this, very, in this one passage, he's bringing together uh, his, his view of workers and Native Americans as people who could give birth to uh, nobility of spirit. And indeed, a great many Nordic Native Americans, uh, for example, the Penobscots, who he employed as guides in Maine, uh, had adapted uh, very quickly uh, to the new uh, market economy by acquiring uh, new skills. And uh, very often in Maine, that meant that they worked as lumbermen. Uh, he was a good looking Indian wearing the ordinary dress of the lumberman. And I may say of the Indian, he had worked a good deal as a lumberman and appeared to identify himself with the lumberman. But the Indians, quote, were much more agreeable and even refined company than the lumberers, the white lumberers, that is. So we went to the Indian camp. So there he could have the best of both worlds, Native Americans and the workers. As his perspective on science changed, it became more holistic, and uh, he realized uh, what, for example, the fur trade was doing to species around the planet. He realized that the expansion of uh, whites and their powerful exploitative methodologies uh, was causing worldwide extinctions just to put it into perspective, uh, we now think of deer as common in New England, now that New England is partially reforested uh, and there isn't quite as much hunting pressure as before. But um, Thoreau never saw a single deer around Concord in his lifetime. They had been extirpated from that part of Massachusetts before he was born. And the deer that we see today are ones that have bounced back from the edge of extinction. The wildest and noblest quadrupeds, even the largest freshwater fishes, the wildest and noblest birds, and the fairest flowers have receded as we advanced, and we have but the most distant knowledge of them, a rumor. 
When I consider that the nobler animals have been exterminated here, I cannot but feel as if I lived in a tamed and, as it were, emasculated country. Is it not a maimed and imperfect nature that I am conversant with? I am reminded that this, my life in nature, is lamentably incomplete. The whole civilized country is to some extent turned into a city. These are, imagine if he had seen Janis Joplin's uh, words, the world paved over as a parking lot. Um, the plight of Native Americans and of so many other uh, peoples and beings on our planet, even in Thoreau's time, made realize, Thoreau realize that everybody was vulnerable to extinction. Here he is contemplating the disappearance of white Americans. Is not the world forever beginning and coming to an end both to men and races? Suppose we were to foresee that the Saxon race to which we belong would become extinct the present winter, disappear from the face of the earth. Um, here's a problematic note. Thoreau was a man of his time, although he, as I hope to show, uh, continue to show, made enormous strides to uh, getting out from underneath uh, the preconceptions of his time and his own residual prejudices he did have some grotesque biases and occasionally he could be very glib. I think very often the, the, um, this glibness uh, is associated with his bad days, days when he was suffering, when he was very ill. Uh, he just didn't have the strength to climb out of himself as it were. Um, but when he was glib, when he did express residual biases, uh, it was culturally influenced by notions of uh, uh, cultural progression, typical of the Western thought in the 19th century, of uh, ideas of manifest destiny. Uh, here are some examples of these biases. Civilization is going on among brutes. And remember, brutes can be a tricky word in his parlance. He just meant animals here, and he certainly loved animals. As well as men, foxes are Indian dogs, striving to be a dog, struggling for light. That made me cringe. Another example, by creating art, the Indian quote, was we le leaving off to be savage. Enough of this would have saved him from extermination. Well, that made me cringe too. I don't think that uh, if uh, Native Americans had made more art, that it would have helped to save them from uh, imported disease and violence. Uh, but Thoreau didn't have the advantage that we have of after reading books like Guns, Germs, and Steel, of seeing what huge forces were at play, economic, uh, microbial, and other forces were at play uh, when people arrived from, uh, from Europe and Africa in the Western Hemisphere and introduced uh, technologies and microbes that uh, didn't exist in the Americas. Did he ever th completely shed his biases? Well, unfortunately, no. Uh, but as I said, he often went, what appears to be a bias isn't always a bias. We have to not only give him the benefit of the doubt, we have to read deep, more deeply. Uh, and we also have to hear his shades of irony and even satire. So he often turned words 
uh, like savages and brutes on their head. Uh, we saw that brutes was just a synonym for the animals he loved. Um, here he is, for example. I spend my time observing the habits of the wild animals, my brute neighbors. I don't think he means anything pejorative by brute there. And savages become so slippery in his mouth. Behold him in the council chamber, conducting with such perfect dignity and decorum, betraying such a sense of justness. These savages are equal to us civilized men in their treaties, and I fear not essentially worse in their wars. Who are the inhabitants of London and New York, but savages who have built cities? Who are the Blackfeet and the Tartars, but citizens roaming the plains? Here again, we see the, his recognition of equivalencies. Um, I think the word which has the pejor most pejorative or potentially pejorative uh, overtone to it in this passage is citizens rather than savages. Was Thoreau trapped to the end in 19th century stereotypes about vanishing versus, versus advancing races? Here we see an, uh, the allegory of manifest destiny uh, advancing across the continent. Um, not quite. Uh, because he began to imagine red men, as he put it, in the future. Here he is uh, seeing, finding uh, a prehistoric artifact and thinking the Indian making an ax or pestle said in the face of the constant flux of things, I at least will live an enduring life. Here he is in Maine. I noticed some new houses as if the tribe had a design to live and remember that mem many members of the tribe had adapted to the modern economy. Perhaps some red man that is to come will fit me, says a talking arrowhead in his journals, to a shaft and make me do his bidding. So in other words, he has an arrowhead uh, speak for him to say that Native Americans indeed have a future, and a very long future. But most importantly, when he came back from his last trip to Maine, he began pigeonholing some of his friends, like uh, John Langdon Sibley and George Curtis, and telling them that the prevailing ideas that the Indian was doomed were wrong. Here he is. The Indian was not doomed, according to Curtis. This is what Curtis reporting on what uh, Thoreau had just uh, told him, but damned because his enemies were his historians. And Thoreau came to uh, disdain many uh, white historians for their biases. One historian tells you with more contempt than pity that the Indian had no religion. Pray, how much more religion has the historian? If Henry Ward Beecher knows so much more about God than another, I would thank him to publish it with as few flourishes as possible. And here is uh, his biographer, uh, Laurel Dasso Walls, uh, reporting on his, uh, the encounters he had, the way he, he, he would uh, basically harangue his various friends and tell them how very wrong they were to think of Indians as vanished or vanishing. Uh, he startled. Bronson Alcott and Ralph Waldo Emerson too, by defending the Indian from the doctrine of being lost or exterminated. So he's come a long way and he's in the vanguard. 
A number of senior Thoreau scholars have attacked Thoreau in very strong terms uh, because they say that although he was an outspoken critic of slavery, that he was a, uh, a, a, uh, an abolitionist, he took a public stance that he never did the same in defense of Native Americans and against their, uh, their persecution. That is false. That is not a question of, for debate. It's not a question of uh, um, interpretation. It's simply false. You need go no further than Civil Disobedience, one of his most famous texts, published in 1849, to find the evidence uh, that it is wrong. Under a government which imprisons any unjustly, the true place for a just man is also in prison. It is there that the fugitive slave and the Mexican prisoner on parole, this is uh, during the Mexican-American War, and the Indian come to plead the wrongs of his race, the wrongs done to Native Americans, should find them, those honorable, those just men, on that separate but more free and honorable ground where the state places those who are not with her but against her, the only house in a slave state in which a free man can abide with honor. There, uh, the plight of Native Americans, the injustices done to them, is uh, one of the three reasons that he gives for going to jail uh, and for his stance in civil disobedience. As he was dying, he continued to seek out Native Americans. And he went so far as to go to Minnesota, uh, where he joined 5,000 uh, Sioux Dakota uh, uh, Native Americans who had come to receive the payment they were due for having given up the uh, southern half of Minnesota. Uh, they were due this payment, uh, this annuity, under a treaty. The federal government had uh, broken its promises uh, and uh, there, the uh, representatives of the government uh, uh, patronized them and lied to them. Uh, one told them that he would take care of them as a father should for his children. And the Minnesota governor told them that a fort had been built to protect them from the whites. Um, the Dakota spokesman, Red Owl, uh, responded firmly and eloquently by citing the government's broken promises. And Thoreau, upon hearing Red Owl speak, noted that the Native Americans, quote, probably have reason to be angry and that they had the advantage in point of truth and earnestness and therefore of eloquence. Thoreau's uh, antagonism towards slavery, and I should, you know, he took his, he, he risked his life uh, by um, harboring fugitive slaves at Walden Pond, uh, and his family harbored fugitive slaves in Concord, uh, he conducted uh, slaves while they were being actively uh, sought after. Uh, he would have been subject to arrest uh, towards the Canadian border. Uh, so he was uh, part of a clandestine network. Uh, the, and um, his, his uh, stance against slavery began to 
began to inform his stance towards Native Americans. His indignation was about what was happening to them was rising before he died. Um, here he is uh, record, talking about a conversation he had in Concord with no less than John Brown six months before the Harper's Ferry raid when John Brown had come to meet a few people in Concord clandestinely to raise financing for the Harper's Ferry raid. And one of those very few people was Thoreau himself. They spoke uh, about many subjects and among them, quote, in California and Oregon, if not nearer home, it is common to treat men exactly like deer, which are hunted. And I read from time to time in Christian newspapers, how many bucks, that is Indian men, their sportsmen have killed. It's unfortunate, but uh, some Thoreau scholars have specifically negated, or said in print that Thoreau never ever took umbrage at the massacres of Native Americans taking place in California at that time. I would suggest that if you read this passage and you understand the, the levels of loathing and irony that he imparts through these words, that you could never uh, take that stance. Thoreau also noted that John Brown, quote, had to skulk in the swamps of Kansas befriended only by Indians and few white men. So he saw that uh, Native Americans were defending this, uh, this militant abolitionist, this crusader against slavery, and that in some ways that their causes, uh, they came to be identified together in his mind. So this brings us to Thoreau's unfinished business. He decided he was going to write a book about arrowheading. He got to the point where he had written uh, thousands of pages in preparation in his so-called Indian notebooks. He had uh, he had uh, he was designing his book. He wanted, he had enough material, he felt, to fill three volumes. So he wondered whether he should uh, bring out three volumes with plates and an index or try to compress it into one. I think that this book, whether it had was compressed into one volume or had come out in three, would have completely changed our view of, Nate, of Thoreau, would have extended our ideas of, of our recognition of him as a social reformer, as a person well in advance of his age uh, in terms of his uh, recognition of, uh, of oppression. And uh, he, it would have uh, been not only a call to arms to end Native American, the persecution of Native Americans, but also have been a celebration of the first Americans as America's uh, natural nobility and exemplars of many, uh, of, of many of the things he aspired to become. But he died with those words on his lips. And I don't think we should leave them unspoken. Thoreau's metamorphosis shows that his arrowheading book would have been a really savage, and here I am twisting that word again, in several times around, a savage trial of civilization and a cry to stop the persecution of the American race. And it would have changed our view of him forever. Here are his last words, Moose Indian, bringing together uh, 
a, an allusion to nature and to the Native Americans uh, who he associated with gr the greatest intimacy with nature. Um, I want to thank you. I want to thank the Mariposa Museum again for inviting me to give this uh, Zoom lecture. Um, and I just want to say that uh, this is dedicated to my wife and to a very good friend, Alan Klein, who, uh, who loved Walden Pond. Thank you. <laughs>